Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, all. I am Rasa Krishnan. I, along with my colleague Dr. Madhusudan, are the moderators this, of this particular webinar on vaporizers. The presenters are Dr. Babraj and Dr. Sanesh. Welcome to the webinar. This webinar on vaporizers, you may think whether it is an absolute necessary entity or is it thrust on us, this little machine, which is being sometimes used, but the story is not so. Anesthesia means general anesthesia. General anesthesia otherwise means, well, use of inhalational agents at their restricted quantity to give anesthetic dub and other characteristics of anesthesia. Well, in 1846, Mr. Oliver Wendell Holmes and Mr. Morton was rather visualizing the dream of Oliver Wendell Holmes that anesthesia could be achieved with a vapor. When we say vapor, we mean inhalational liquid. And from today onwards, I want all my friends to use the term vapor, not inhalational liquid. So this inhalational liquid, whether either or any of the drugs which came along the way, including the spurine, which is the current drug which is being used. And the vaporizer is one particular little machinery which is used along with the anesthesia machine. And this machine is going to deliver the required quantity of the vapor to the anesthetic gas delivery system. That's the importance. Because GA means, well, inhalation liquid is being attached to it. Because there is no GA without inhalation liquid. Well, you may be able to give, but the proper depth of a general anesthesia is combined with gas, oxygen, your muscle relaxant, your vapor, and your analgesics, or say narcotics. Well, so that is the importance. And say from 1846 onwards, so many apparatus were designed to give the inhalation liquid available in the inhaling mixture. Mr. Morton started with his bladder, turned out anesthetic vaporizer, which was later he himself modified Morton's anesthesia inhaler. And a lot of instruments came up in the old times, a lot of apparatus. Well, you may be knowing some of the apparatus. Well, fly can, trial and air, boil bottle, EMO, OMV, well, and the last was in that particular old period, the arrival of the halothane and the flow tech machines. Well, flow tech machine one, two, three stayed for some time. By that particular time, the either was going out. Either enjoyed the scene for nearly 150 years, whereas the halothane was able to be there only for 40 years. After the halothane comes up, isofluorine. Well, current is seofluorine and desfluorine. Now, mostly we play with seofluorine and desfluorine to give adequate depth of anesthesia. And a lot of apparatus were designed. And the apparatus were designed depending on the characteristics. And probably some years back, we were classifying this particular machine or this particular small apparatus, which is being used as either a draw over apparatus or a flow over apparatus. Draw means you are drawing the anesthetic into the system, draw over. All those particular machines which I was telling was a draw over apparatus, but later it moved out to the flow over. In the flow over apparatus, for the present day vaporizers, so many characteristics of the particular inhalational agent which are being used are put into 
functional making of the vaporizer. And today, our friends are going to give you a brief description of the functional characteristics of the vapors and what is required for every particular vapor and how the new machines or the new vaporizers came up, say, starting from the Tech 4 onwards, Tech 4, 5, 6, 7, and the newer ones called the Aladdin cassettes or the injection vaporizers, or say, select a tech or say the latest in the market, Anaconda. And these are the areas which are going to be discussed today. And of importance in the past is the Epstein, Macintosh, Oxford apparatus, otherwise we fondly call EMO apparatus. EMO and EAV, the Oxford inflating bellows, EMO and OAV remain there for nearly 30 years. Amidst all this particular competition was going on because that was one of the versatile machines which was used upon a time for all sorts of activities, say in abnormal environments or in any particular problem or in any distress situation or probably a particular piece of equipment which could be carried around for giving anesthesia. Which, well, Dr. Mazun, Major General T.P. Mazun, who was in the army for quite a number of years, and he used this particular apparatus, well, for many, many times, we'll be giving a brief on that particular apparatus. And I request now, Bob Rai to take over. Is Bob Rai taking over or Sanish taking over? I don't know. Well, you can go ahead with a little bit of physics. And then, well, when the time comes, well, we'll ask Dr. Mulsoon to describe the EMO and then go ahead with the newer machines. Thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Babraj, you can start. Okay. Physical I'm, principles. Slide, slide. Yeah, I'll I'm yeah. Sure. share. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, so my job is to uh, discuss the physical principles of vaporizers. Uh, the, knowing about the physics, or the physics related to vaporizer is mandatory to understand the function of vaporizer. It's a very basic topic. Many postgraduates think that it's boring and it's difficult. It is not so. It's very simple. What do you mean by a vaporizer? It is a device which allows vaporization of a liquid anesthetic and then it mixes with the carrier gas and this is administered to a patient. Actually, there are different stages in the functioning of a vaporizer. The one, the liquid volatile anesthetic is converted into vapor. Second, this vapor is mixed with carrier gas. Carrier gas can be oxygen, oxygen, air, or oxygen nitrous oxide. And this is to be delivered to the patient in a controlled manner. That means if you are planning to give on person halothane, the on person halothane should be delivered by the vaporizer. There is a meaning of the controlled manner. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there are a few terminologies which every Postgraduate, every anesthetist should be familiar with saturated vapor pressure, boiling point, heat of vaporization, specific heat, and thermal conductivity. What is the meaning of SVP? See, a container having liquid. You can see the liquid there. You can see the molecules inside the liquid. And the molecules are actually they are attracted to each other. This is called the cohesion. Because of the cohesive forces, the molecules are attracted to each other. But there is something more is happening in a liquid that is the constant motion of the molecule. This is because of the kinetic energy. So these are in opposing directions. So the cohesion keeps the molecules together while the kinetic energy makes the molecules move. So what happens at the surface? You can see the surface of the liquid. 
the molecules are held only by the molecules which are below there is no one to hold it from the above area so the molecules because of the kinetic energy it escapes into the air into the vacuum and these molecules are known as vapor so you can say that the vapor is a gaseous phase of a liquid in the second picture you can see it's a closed container so the molecules are escaping into the air above and after some time you can see there is an equilibrium reaching because some of the molecules will go back some of the molecule will jump out and finally an equilibrium is reached and then at that time the upper part of the uh, container is saturated with vapor the pressure exerted by this vapor is known as vapor pressure once it is saturated you call it as saturated vapor pressure and whenever you say saturated vapor pressure suppose i say svp of halothane is 243 it is meaningless if i am not mentioning the temperature i should say svp of halothane is 248 at 20 degrees centigrade because the saturation depends upon the temperature of the liquid in the next picture you can see the heat is applied so when the heat is applied to the liquid it increases the kinetic energy of the molecule and more and more molecules are escaping and becoming vapor exerting more svp so remember whenever svp is mentioned mention temperature also the boiling point so boiling point is expressed in temperature see the temperature at which vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure and at that point liquid starts to boil this is boiling point and what's the difference between boiling and evaporation when i keep some water in a glass after a few days it disappears this is because of the evaporation when i boil that glass of water you can see bubbles coming out what is the cause of bubble the bubbles are actually the gaseous phase of the water so bubbling is something which is happening in the body of the liquid while vaporization happens on the surface liquid this is the difference between boiling and vaporization now what happens to boiling point when there is a change in atmospheric pressure see in at the sea level the water boils at 100 degrees centigrade okay you go to everest let us say the pressure is 500 or 400 mm mercury then the boiling point will come down to around 70 to 80 degrees centigrade and that is why people find it difficult to you know cook rice when you go to the high altitude because of the reduction of the boiling point so this is also a very important point when the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure lowers the boiling point is also coming down and in pressure cooker the same thing happens you are increasing the pressure inside so the water or the food material is boiling water is boiling at a higher temperature that hastens cooking so this graph shows you you can see the water look at the graph which is showing water so at a pressure of 760 it boils at 100 degree centigrade and if it is against 400 mm mercury you can see it happens around 80 to 70 degree centigrade volatility sorry volatility the speed at which a liquid vaporizes depends not only its ambient temperature and pressure but also on its volatility a more volatile liquid has weaker cohesive forces between its molecule such that they require less energy a simple example desflurane desflurane has a very high svp of around 690 and its volatility is very much higher than halothane whose svp is around 248 so there are three factors which actually determines the speed of vaporization one is the temperature second one is the pressure and the third one is the the volatility now heat of vaporization by definition it is a number of calories required to convert 1 gram of liquid into vapor or it can also be expressed as the number of calories necessary to convert 1 ml of liquid into vapor generally for all anesthetics 
around 60 calories are needed to convert 1 ml of anesthetic into vapor. And what is the importance of heat of vaporization? I said earlier, when the uh, liquid become vapor, it cools down. Because the of the cooling down, the kinetic energy comes down in the body of the liquid. And since the kinetic energy is going down, the vaporization is slowed down. So in a vaporizer, if you're not taking any measures to keep the temperature stable, you will see that the vaporization gradually comes down and your vaporizer output concentration gradually comes down, down and so. So here comes the importance of heat of vaporization. You have to provide this heat of vaporization so that you can keep the temperature stable and also you can maintain the vaporization. Special heat. Now this is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree centigrade. It can also be defined as the amount of heat required to raise temperature of one ml of substance. It can be one gram or one ml by one degree centigrade. What's the clinical significance? One, it determines how much heat is to be supplied to the liquid anesthetic. And second, the specific heat determines with which material vaporizer is to be constructed. See, copper is having very high specific heat. So if the vaporizer is uh, built with copper, the copper can act as a source of heat so that vaporizer output concentration can be maintained constant. The last part of physical principle is thermal conductivity. This is a measure of speed with which heat flows through a substance. See, the vaporizer is made up of copper. And if the speed is good, the material or the container can transmit heat from outside into the liquid so that vaporization can be kept constant. So, so far we learned SVP, boiling point, heat of vaporization, specific heat, and thermal conductivity. These are the four, the five basic physical principles concerned with vaporizers. Now, you need to know some more terminologies. How to express concentration? See, there are two methods. One is volume percentage. Okay, you say halothane, one person. Isofluorine, two person. Cyberfluorine, seven person. And there is one more method of expressing it that is partial pressure. Now, which is more accurate or which is more specific? Is it volume percentage or partial pressure? I'll tell you an example. When I say 21% oxygen, it doesn't mean anything. If I say 21% oxygen in 760 millimeter mercury, that is at sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is on 60. The same percentage of 21% in Everest, let us say at a height where the pressure is 500 millimeter mercury, the partial pressure is lower. It is only 105 millimeter of mercury. That means when the ambient pressure comes down, even though the concentration is same, the partial pressure is lowered. You know, that is a cause of hypoxia at high altitude, even though the concentration of oxygen is 20% there. So this is the importance. There's a difference between volume percentage and partial pressure. The more absolute value is partial pressure. Clinically significant one is partial pressure. And there are different units by which you can express partial pressure, especially important for postgraduates. Millimeter mercury, kilopascal. So this is the, how you equate. 760 millimeter mercury, which is equal to one bar, which is equal to 15 pound square inch, which is equal to 1,000 centimeters of water, which is equal to one kilogram per centimeter square, which is equal to 100 kPa. Because I have seen in some exams, especially ABG and all, they don't give millimeter HG values, they may be giving kPa. So if you know this conversion, it is easy to handle the situation. Now, Dalton's law of partial pressure. What is, what is it? See, suppose a chamber contains two gases, gas A and B. Okay, now I consider my room where I'm sitting. Here, there are two gases. One is nitrogen, another one is oxygen. 21% is oxygen, the rest is nitrogen. So this 21% oxygen is exerting a partial pressure of 160 and the partial pressure exerted by nitrogen is 760 minus 160. So the law is correct. The sum of the partial pressures of the gas 
is equal to the total pressure. Now you can see an equation below. I said, if you know the percentage, it is easy to convert it into partial pressure. The equation is easy, 760 into 21 by 100. Suppose you are at a high altitude, 500 into 21 by 100. Now the reverse, uh, reverse can be used to calculate volume percentage also. If you know the partial pressure, I say in my room, the partial pressure function is 160 millimeters of mercury. And I know the atmospheric pressure is 760. So I want to know the concentration of oxygen in my room. Again, it is easy, 160 divided by 760 into 100. Now, what is the importance of knowing it? I will show you the next slide. So the question is, you have a bottle of halothane. My question is, what is the percentage of halothane above the liquid level? You can see the halothane vapor at the top, and you want to know, how much percentage of halothane will be at the top of the bottle? Let us calculate. Everyone knows SVP of halothane is 243 millimeter at 20 degrees centigrade. And the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. So you can calculate the percentage of halothane using the formula 243 divided by 760 into 100. That means 32 percentage. So when you open up a bottle of halothane, the percentage of halothane escaping is around 32 percentage. Now what is the importance of knowing this? Okay, I will explain when I uh, reach the description of variable uh, bypass vaporizers. <clears throat> now how do you classify a vaporizer? So this is a common question during your viva. A vaporizer is put in front of you and exam will be asking, explain or describe or classify. So you should know the basic steps. Number one, it can be classified according to the method of vaporization. Now there are two types of, two methods of vaporization. There are different methods of vaporization. One is flow over. What's the meaning of flow over? It simply means the carrier gas is flowing over the surface of the liquid inside the vaporization chamber. There is no confusion. Now, second is bubble through. Again, symbol, the carrier gas is bubbling through the liquid. It is not just flowing over the liquid. It is bubbling through the liquid. Now, the third one, of course, there is an option where you can move between flow over or bubble through. I will explain it. And the last one, injection type. So these are the four methods, flow over, bubble through, flow over or bubble through, and injection type. I'll give you examples also. Flow over, all our tech vaporizers are flow over. Bubble through, the copper kettle, I will show, it, show the copper kettle later on. Copper kettle is an example of bubble through vaporizer. And the third one, boils bottle, where you can move between flow over or bubble through by you know, some uh, plunging something. I will show, it, show that later on. And the injection type is tech six. Tech 6 is an example of injection type of vaporizer. So I repeat, the class, vaporizers can be classified according to the method of vaporization, flow over, example, tech excluding 6, bubble through, example, copper kettle, flow over or bubble through, where you can have the option, boils bottle, and the last one, injection type, tech 6. So this picture, this is Boyle's bottle. I think many of the new generation might not have seen this one. This is the Boyle's bottle. You can see on the left side. And on the right side, it is, uh, it is an enlarged view. You can see a liver. Just concentrate on the left side at photo. You can see a liver, which can be moved up and down. And when it is a down position, you call it as off position. And liver can be moved up. And at the top, it is the on position. See, liver can be in different position. One, it is off position, or it can be between, or it can be on position. Okay, in off position, what happens is, look at the right-sided picture, the whole carrier gas is passing through the vaporizing chamber. Sorry, bypass chamber. So this is the vaporizing chamber, this is the bypass chamber. The whole carrier gas is passing through the bypass chamber. No carrier gas passes through the vaporizing chamber, so no vapor goes to the patient. Now, now you are turning the lever and putting it in the on position. 
So here what happens is all the carrier gas, the whole carrier gas is going into the vaporizing chamber where you can see the liquid and you can see a curved tube, a U tube and there is another tube which is a plunger. You can see this is a plunger and the bottom of the plunger is a little widened, you call it as a cowl. So when the plunger is up, in the second picture you can see the plunger is up, the carrier gas comes, it just flows over the liquid vapor. Now it is functioning as a flow over vaporizer. Now I am going to push the plunger down. The third picture you can see plunger has been pushed down and the cowl has gone into the liquid. Now the flow over vaporizer has been converted into a bubble through vaporizer. So Bowie's bottle is a classical example where you can move between flow over and bubble through mechanism. Now, so we learned, depending upon the method of vaporization, we learned few classification. Now, the second one is method of regulating output concentration. See, there are two divisions. One is variable bypass. This is one method of regulating output concentration. And second one is measured flow. Now, most all the modern vaporizers, excluding few, are variable bypass. And a classical example of measured flow is a historical thing, copper kettle. I'll come to that later on. Now, regarding variable bypass, you can see again two classification, variable bypass with fully saturated vapor chamber. So our tech and newer ones are coming under this group. And variable bypass with a variably saturated vapor exchanger, example is our Boyle's protein. And measured flow example is copper kettle. Now, variable bypass vaporizer. Now, this is a very symbolic representation of a vaporizer. You can see the vaporizing chamber which contains the liquid. You can see the bypass chamber. You can see the inlet on the left side and there is outlet on the right side. See the gas, the carrier gas is coming through the inlet. Now, it will be split into two. The major chunk of this carrier gas goes into the bypass chamber. A very small amount of this carrier gas will go into the vaporizing chamber. I said major chunk goes through the bypass chamber and small amount goes into the vaporizing chamber. Right? Now, this gas which had entered into the vaporizing chamber will be saturated. Let us say it is salothane. So, the carrier gas which has entered into the vaporizing chamber has a concentration of 32 percentage which is lethal to the patient. So, the gas which is coming out of the vaporizing chamber with this 32 percentage of halothane has to be diluted. So, that is the function of the gas coming from bypass chamber. So, bypass chamber gas function is to dilute the lethal amounts of vapor coming out of the vaporizing chamber. Now, they join together and goes out and gives you the vaporizer output concentration, VOC. Sivofluorine, I will uh, take another example, which is a commonly used one, Sivofluorine. If you look into the vaporizing chamber, see concentration of Sivofluorine is 21 percentage. Look at its MAC, it is 1.9. So this 21 percentage of Sivofluorine coming out of this vaporizing chamber is diluted by the carrier gas and then it results in the desired concentration set by you. So I repeat, fresh gas from VC is to be diluted by the gas through the bypass chamber. Now, what is splitting ratio? I said the gas comes into the vaporizer, split into two, and the ratio between the bypass to vaporized chamber. I repeat, it is a ratio of fresh gas between bypass and vaporized chamber is splitting ratio. Now, there are two things which determine splitting ratio. One is dial setting. Okay, you set at 1%. Now, you are going to set at 2%. There is a change in splitting ratio. When you put it as 2%, more gas is going into the vaporization chamber. 
Now, one more physical principle which determines splitting ratio is none other than saturated paper pressure. So, these are the two parameters which determine splitting ratio. One is the dial setting and second one is saturated paper pressure. So, this chart shows you the splitting ratio of different agents. Okay, let us take halothane. I'm going to set the dial at one percentage. What is the splitting ratio? 46 is to 1. Okay, I'm going to increase the halothane concentration to 2 percentage. Now see, the change has occurred. It has become 23 is to 1. Okay, I'm going to increase to 3 percentage. Now it has become 15 is to 1. So take home message is that when you increase the dial concentration, more gas enters the vaporization chamber and picks up more vapor. Okay, now let me con uh, compare halothane and zeofluorine. I said zeofluorine has a low SVP and halothane has got a higher SVP. Look at the uh, splitting ratio. When you set the dial at 1%, for halothane, the splitting ratio is 46 is to 1 and for zeofluorine, it is 25 is to 1. The reason being, it is less volatile. Now, let me explain. What do you mean by this 46 is to 1? 47 ml of fresh gas enters into the vaporizer. 46 ml goes through the vapor, uh, bypass and only 1 ml enters and then mixes together and the final delivery is 1 percentage halothane. This is a very simple mathematics. When I say 25 is to 1, I go to the previous CO fluorine, 25 is to 1. 26 ml of fresh gas enters into the CO fluorine vaporizer. 25 ml goes through the bypass and 1 ml goes through the vapor chamber and which results in 1% CO fluorine vaporizer output concentration. Okay, I was explaining the variable bypass vaporizer. The second classification is measured flow. What do you mean by measured flow? Classical example is copper kettle. So in variable bypass, the fresh gas enters into the vaporizer, then split into two. But in measured flow, you can look at the picture. This is the schematic representation of the vaporizer, the something filled with the red thing, it is halothane. And you see, this vaporizer has its own dedicated flow meter, which gives oxygen. So this vaporizer, copper kettle, has its own vap uh, flow meter, which gives oxygen, this one. So I start oxygen, oxygen goes in, actually I am, I am just tracing the path. The oxygen is entering into the liquid, it is bubbling, so it is an example of bubble through vaporizer. It is fully saturated and coming out. Okay, just remember the mathematic I said earlier, if it is halothane, this oxygen is coming out of copper kettle with 32 percentage of halothane, which is definitely fatal. So I have another set of uh, 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 flow meter, which is dedicated to the Boyle's machine, which is dedicated to the anesthesia machine, which is shown on the left side, this one, where I may give oxygen, I may give nitrous oxide, I may give a combination of oxygen nitrous oxide, and this carrier gas, I would say it is carrier gas, comes, I'm tracing it, and now it joins with the oxygen which has come out of copper kettle and dilutes. And But the problem here is, you have to, anesthetist has to calculate. There should be a chart. You have to calculate the oxygen flow, you have to calculate the fresh gas flow. It, it was a very cumbersome job, but in variable bypass, there is no such issues. You just turn the dial, 1%, 2%, etc. You get the desired concentration. So this is the major difference between variable bypass and measured flow. I repeat, in variable bypass, the splitting happens inside the vaporizer. In measured flow, the splitting happens outside. This is a simple way of differentiating between variable bypass and measured flow. Now, coming to the third one, temperature compensation. So there are different uh, methods. One is automatic thermocompensation. Examples are tech, all the tech. Both they are having bimetallic strips. 
as thermocompensatory mechanism. And there is something called vapor 90 in 1, which has got a metal rod as a uh, thermal, thermo, thermal compensatory mechanism. And EMO, the historical one, its thermal compensation was using a bellow which contains ether. And Penlon, this is another vaporizer, which has fluid filled bellows. And coming to the second classification, supplied heat, you know, tech six, you are heating the desflurane. So this is an example of supplied heat, and that is a method of temperature compensation. Now this continues. Manual thermal compensation, nowadays not used, it was used with copper kettle. And there are certain vaporizers in which there is no thermal compensation. Classical example will be our Boyle's bottle. I showed you the Boyle's bottle earlier. It is a glass bottle. And there is no mechanism by which you can maintain the temperature of the either inside. I told you about heat of vaporization. When the liquid vaporizes, it cools. When the liquid cools, vaporization comes down. The purpose of compensation is to maintain the vaporization. In Boyle's bottle, in Goldman, there is no thermocompensation. So when you put the dial at a particular point, after some time you will see that the vaporizer output concentration will be coming down. Now, it's, uh, the fifth type of temperature compensation is electronic, which is used in Aladdin. So just to sum up, the purpose of temperature compensation, it is to maintain the constant, constant vaporizer output. And how does it function? In most of the modern vaporizers, it is functioning by a mechanism called flow alteration. I will explain what is the meaning of flow alteration. See, this is a symbolic uh, representation of a vaporizer. You can see the bypass gas flowing. I am just tracing it. Tracing it. It has entered into the bypass, now going out. Now, the gas is split. A small amount goes into the vaporizing chamber, picks up the vapor, goes out. And you can see something inside the bypass chamber. And this is known as a bimetallic strip. Actually, this is made up of two metals. Two metals. And when the temperature changes, this bimetallic strip will curve. Carefully look into the picture. This arrow is an aperture through which the carrier gas is passing through the bypass chamber and the bimetallic strip is situated close, close to it. Now, the temperature is coming down. What happened? The bimetallic strip has a change in curvature and it has reduced the aperture. aperture and the result is the gas, more gas will be diverted through the vaporizing chamber. I repeat, earlier picture, the gas was going through the BC bypass chamber, gas was going through the vaporizing chamber. As vaporization continues, there is a fall in the temperature of the liquid, which is sensed by the bimetallic strip. Because of the reduced temperature, there is a change in orientation of the bimetallic strip. It is moving towards the aperture, and because of the reduction in the aperture, the more gas is diverted through the vaporizing chamber, enhancing better vapor output. So this is a simple explanation how a bimetallic strip works. So what you see here is a flow change, flow diversion. That is why I said temperature compensation by diversion of the flow. A flow alteration. Now, in vapor 191, the mechanism is a little different. The inner rod is made up of invar, a relatively non expansive metal. The outer jacket is in contact with the vaporized liquid, you can see, which is made up of brass. Now, the vaporization happens, temperature, the temperature of the liquid goes down, it cools. Now what happens? Look at the picture. Now the road has moved up. So when the road is moving up, it is actually providing resistance to the flow through the bypass chamber. So 
the gas has no option the gas has to be diverted through the vaporization chamber again this is a method of temperature compensation by flow alteration now just to recapitulate this is a golden goldman vaporizer which is actually invented in 1959 look at this there is only a glass bottle there is no wick inside you fill the bottle with halothane up to 30 ml and you can see the dial can be moved and what happens is after some time you will see the concentration of halothane at the output will be coming down because of the lack of temperature compensation because there is no method there is no bimetallic strip there is no method of providing heat to the liquid so a usual question which is asked in viva this is for pgs how to maintain the output concentration from a golden goldman vaporizer there are different method one method you just fill it to the maximum what is the advantage of filling the halothane this bottle with maximum that is up to 30 ml rather than partial filling the volume is good so it has got a better temperature reservoir number one second one you can wipe the bottle with a warm cloth actually we are providing you are increasing the temperature of the halothane in the glass bottle second and third you can put a wick inside it can be a cloth wick so that surface area is increased and the next method you can keep two goldman vaporizers in series so that the vaporizer output concentration at the downstream will be the sum of one and two so these are the four methods by which you can increase or you can maintain vaporizer output concentration with a goldman vaporizer one fill it to the maximum possible second why with a warm cloth third uh, you can put some wicks and fourth you can use two goldman vaporizers in series now this is also a historical equipment oxford miniature vaporizer actually br k sir had mentioned about it now there is one method of providing heat inside it actually you can fill its reservoir with glycol or water there is a, some space inside it so when you fill with water or glycol commonly it is used with used to, it is filled with glycol especially in cold countries this glycol or water can act as a water or heat reservoir or heat buffer you can say there is some amount of provision of temperature compared with the goldman vaporizer now coming to the next point agent specificity see all the modern vaporizers are agent specific that means you cannot fill one vaporizer with another agent there are so many hazards when you fill a particular vaporizer with a wrong agent so most of the modern things are agent specific and there are some vaporizers which could be filled with multiple agent example is our goldman vaporizer you can use halothane you can use isofluorine in the same bottle but remember all the modern vaporizers it is prohibited now coming to plenum or drawover what do you mean by plenum what do you mean by drawover actually sir has mentioned about drawover because most of our historical vaporizers like emo they were drawover vaporizer drawover means and regarding plenum most of the modern vaporizers they are plenum they are high resistance vaporizers that means you need carrier gas at a higher pressure you cannot breathe through this plenum vaporizers because their resistance is very high drawover means goldman is an example of drawover emo it can be used as a drawover omv which can be used as a drawover you can remember the mnemonic geo g e o example of drawover now how does a drawover vaporizer function okay before that i will just explain plenum vaporizer a positive pressure upstream of the vaporizer by gas from flow meter is pushing the carrier gas 
through the vaporizer towards the patient. And remember, all plenum vaporizers are high resistance vaporizers. There is a flow meter. From the flow meter, gas comes under pressure and the gas comes under pressure, goes through the vaporizer and comes out. And regarding drawover, it is totally different from plenum vaporizer. Remember, drawover vaporizers are low resistance vaporizers. You can see in the picture, the vaporizer, the symbolic representation and the patient. And the patient is actually inspiring. And it is the patient's inspiratory effort which draws the carrier gas through the vaporizer. So that's a very important point. With plenum, it is the pressurized gas which is passing through the vaporizing chamber. But with draw vaporizer, it is the patient's inspiratory effort which draws the carrier gas through the vaporizing chamber. Actually, the picture shows two types of draw vaporizer. This is a simple one. And in the second one, you see an additional bellow. Actually, these bellows are used with vaporizers like EMO. I think uh, Masoon sir will be explaining more about EMO and OIB. Now, coming to the last part of classification of vaporizer, location. Now, actually, this classification is obsolete now because nobody is using any vaporizer as in-circuit nowadays. But for completion's sake, I would like to mention it. Out of circuit, you call it as VOC, vaporizer, outside circuit. What is the meaning of circuit? It is nothing but circle system. Inside circuit, vaporizer, inside circuit. This is the two types of location. Example of out of circuit, VOC, all the tech, Pendulon, Aladdin, etc. And regarding VIC, Goldman is an example of vaporizer, inside the circuit. Sorry. So this is a schematic representation of a VOC. This is a circle system. You can see the bag. You can see the carbon dioxide absorber. This is the patient end. And you can see the vaporizer in the, is in the anesthesia machine. It is in the bag bar. The fresh gas comes picks up the vapor, goes into the circle system. And of course, this vapor is going to circulate between the patient and the circle absorber. What happens in VIC? See, there is a major difference. This VIC, the classical example would be our Goldman vaporizer, is inside the circle system. It is not in the back bar of the machine. It is inside the circle system. And if you concentrate on this picture, the vaporizer, the fresh gas from the machine goes to the bag, goes to the absorber, goes to the patient, comes back from the patient, which contains carbon dioxide, which enters the vaporizer, picks up the vapor, goes back, carbon dioxide is absorbed, going to the patient. Now, from the patient, the expeder now contains not only carbon dioxide, not only some amount of oxygen, but also some amount of vapor. Now, this vaporizer inside the circuit, the input contains vapor. That's the major difference. In VOC, the fresh gas coming into the vaporizer was pure. It was devoid of any vapor. But in a VAC system, the gas entering into the vaporizer contains the vapor. So this is a major difference between VOC and VIC. Now, I think the classification is over. Now, I will learn something about the factors influencing variable, variable bypass output concentration. One is fresh gas flow. Second is the temperature, the ambient temperature. Third one is the intermittent back pressures applied to the vaporizer from the reservoir bag or from the ventilator. And the fourth one, the carrier gas composition. And the fifth one, barometric pressure. Okay, coming to the first point, fresh gas flow. See, if the flow is between, let us say, 
one liter or four liter or five liter, most of the vaporizers will not show any change in vaporizer of the concentration between this flow of one to four. But if the flow is too low, let us say 250 ml per minute, you call it this metabolic flow, 250 ml of what happens to the vaporizer output. We used to, we normally think that, okay, the flow is very slow. So the very slow flow is going to get more vapor and the vaporizer output concentration is going to be higher. It is not so. When the fresh gas flow is too low, like 250 ml per minute, now because of the density, because of the inertia, because of the too slow flow, what happens is vaporizer output concentration is reduced. Okay, we will see what happens if the flow is too large. Let us say the flow is 15 liters per minute, too large a flow. So here the problem is the flow is high, but there is no time for this fresh gas to get saturated with the vapor. So because of the problem, even though the flow is too high, like 15 ml per minute, 15 liter per minute, the vaporizer output concentration is going to be low. So take home message, if the flow is too low, like 250 ml per minute, VOC, vaporizer output concentration, is going to be lower than you fixed. Second point, if the fresh gas flow is too high, like 15 liters per minute, again, the same thing is going to happen. Vaporizer output concentration is going to be lesser than that you fixed. Now, second point, temperature. Now, up to a temperature of 40 degrees centigrade, nothing happens. But if you go to a place, where temperature is too high, let us say 50 degrees centigrade, what happens? You know, halothane boiling point is 50 degrees centigrade. So if you take your vaporizer to an area where temperature is too high, naturally boiling is going to happen and vaporizer output concentration is going to be larger. So in usually use clinical scenario, there is not much change with vaporizer output concentration because temperature is almost constant. Now, we'll move on to the effect of intermittent back pressure. See, intermittent back pressure can happen in two situations. One, you are squeezing the back. Positive pressure is generated, which is reflected back onto the vaporizer and going to have some effect. Second, you're activating oxygen flush. You know, oxygen flush gives a 30 to 70 liters per minute flow with a PSI of about 30, 30 PSI, 30 to 40 PSI. So in these two situations, there will be back pressure applying onto the vaporizer, which can result in two effects, namely pumping effect. So pumping effect simply means your vaporizer output concentration is going to be higher. And second effect is pressurizing effect. It simply means your vaporizing, vaporizer output concentration is going to be lower. So intermittent back pressure can have two effects. One is pumping effect. Your output concentration is going to be higher than you set. Pressurizing effect, your VOC is going to be lower than the concentration you set. Now, what's the mechanism? This is also a usual question in Viva. So I will try to make it sim simple. So this pumping effect happens in certain situations. Low fresh gas flow rates. Classical examples, when you are using your circle system, you keep a flow of one liter, 1.5 liter or two liter, pumping effect can happen. Second, low liquid level in the vaporizing chamber. Your anesthesia technician forgot to fill the vaporizer. And you look at the vaporizer chamber and you see the liquid level is too, too low. Pumping effect can happen. And the third, low dial setting. Okay, you are planning to maintain the vapor concentration with, let us say, one percentage or 0.3 percentage. So remember, three low, low fresh gas flow, low liquid level, low dial settings with high peak pressures. You forgot to open the APL valve of your main circuit, high peak pressures. And the last one, very frequently this is happening. Every time you are activating your oxygen flush or you are squeezing the bag without, you know, closing the valve properly. So I repeat, low fresh gas flow, low liquid level, low dial setting, high peak pressures, and frequent pressure changes can predispose to pumping effect. 
What is the mechanism? See, this is again the symbolic representation. You can see the gas coming in, split into two. The major chunk goes through the bypass, small amount goes through the vaporized chamber. And now you squeeze the bag. You activated your oxygen flash. Now, what happens is there is an increase in pressure at the outlet of the outlet of the vaporizer. Now it is going to get reflected. Now, what happens now? Because of the high pressure, the gas from the uh, from the actually the the downstream gas, which contain the vapor, is coming back and enter into the bypass chamber. And you can also see that it is going into the vaporizing chamber, right? High pressure is applied. The pressure downstream, the uh, the flow downstream is reversing. It is going into the bypass chamber. It is also going into the vaporizing chamber. Now, suddenly the pressure is lowered. What happens now? See, the gas which has entered back into the vaporizing chamber is going to pick more molecules. More molecules are picked up. Its saturation is more. Now, there is a sudden loss of pressure in the outlet of the vaporizer. Now, what happens is, just concentrate on the left side of the picture where you can see something called inlet to the vaporizing chamber. I repeat, inlet to the vaporizing chamber. See, this inlet is different from this one. This is the inlet to the vaporizer. And this, my mouse is moving. This is inlet to the vaporizing chamber. And during this sudden loss of pressure, what happens is the fresh gas, not fresh gas, actually the, the gas which contained the vapor, which has entered into the vaporized chamber, which picked up more vapor, is entering into the inlet to the vaporizing chamber. Now, just concentrate here. This vapor molecules are entering into the bypass. See, in a normal scenario, bypass chamber should not contain any vapor. That is the rule. It contains only fresh gas. Now, during pumping effort, what happens is the gas inside the vaporizing chamber escapes into the inlet to the vaporizing chamber, and now it goes into the bypass chamber. You can see the orange colored things. These are nothing but the vapor. Now, something which was prohibited has happened. Now, look at the vaporizer output concentration. It is naturally going to be higher. I think it is understood. OK, I will just uh, repeat it once again. A pressure was applied onto the outlet. The gas flow has been reversed. The gas enters into the bypass chamber as well into the vaporizing chamber. The gas which entered into the vaporizing chamber picks up the vapor molecules. And on the left side of the picture, you can see some gas with vapor is attempting to enter into the inlet to the vaporizing chamber, inlet to the vaporizing chamber. And now there is a sudden loss of pressure. Now, the bypass chamber, I would say bypass chamber is contaminated with the vapor from the vaporization chamber resulted in increase in the vaporizer output concentration. And this is pumping effect. Now, what is pressure and what are the mechanisms by which you can reduce it? Now, one, you reduce the size of the vaporization chamber. Second, I told you about the length inlet to the vaporized chamber. Okay, you increase the length so that the carrier gas with vapor will not get a chance to enter into the bypass chamber. This is by lengthening the inlet to the vaporized chamber, which is done beautifully in the tech file. And the third, you can remove the wicks from the entry point of the vapor, vaporized chamber. And the fourth, you can increase the resistance of vaporized chamber. These are the four methods by which you can reduce the pumping effect. Number one, reduce the size of vaporizing chamber. Second one, increase the length of inlet to the vaporizing chamber. And the third, remove all the wicks from the entry point of that inlet into the vaporizing chamber. And the fourth is increasing the resistance of vaporizer. And what can you do in your anesthesia machine to reduce pumping effect? You can put a check valve downstream the vaporizer. So these are the methods by which you can reduce pumping effect. Now moving on to the next effect, pressurizing effect.
So there is only one point needs to be remembered. The pressurizing effect happens if the flow rates are very high. With pumping effect, the flow rates are very low, but pressurizing effect can happen when the flow rates are high. So all other parameters are same as that of pumping effect. Okay, we'll move on to the picture. Again, our vaporizer with vaporizing chamber and bypass. The flow is too high. There's a difference. In the earlier scenario, the flow was too low. Now here, the flow is too high. And probably you are remembering what happens when you give a very high flow of 15 liters to, per minute. The vaporizer output concentration is going to be low. Now that problem is actually augmented when you give a positive pressure. See, the positive pressure is applied. The gas is going in a reverse manner. Now, the more gas, remember, my flow is very high. My gas flow is very high. So, a lot of fresh gas, just containing vapor, is going to enter my vaporizing chamber. But number of vapor molecules is almost same. But my fresh gas volume is too high. My number of vaporizer, vapor molecules are almost constant. Now, the net result is the number of vapor per the number of molecules of fresh gas is low. So the result is low vaporizer output concentration. So this is the difference between pumping and pressurizing. Pumping happens with low dial setting. Pressurizing happens with high flow rate. Good evening. I think this is an EMO inhaler, and uh, I think uh, Masoon sir is very much well versed with this, the historical equipment. I uh, request sir to explain about the apparatus. Thank you, sir. Good evening to you. To begin with, to add the administration of anesthesia even before the demonstration on 1946 by Morton. He had a volatile liquid and it had a vapor has to be used for administering to the patient, whether for either frolics or for the experimental administrations. A simple piece of cloth acted as a vaporizer. And the precision had been lacking and it became a very major concern after the death of uh, Hannah Greener, the first ever casualty in anesthesia. The success of a good anesthetic procedure depends on the ability of the anesthesiologist to administer the drugs in precise concentrations throughout the procedure, irrespective of the atmospheric conditions or the length of the anesthetic procedure. A breakthrough in this was achieved by Professor McIntosh in 1950, when the EMO apparatus was designed in Oxford Department of Anesthetics. EMO stands for Epstein, McIntosh, Oxford apparatus, Epstein being the physicist who had helped Professor McIntosh to design this particular equipment and develop it. All the aspects which had been described by Dr. Babaraj in taking to, uh, have been taken into consideration while designing this particular equipment as early as 1950. It is a drop over vaporizer where the gases are precisely air is drawn by the patient's effort over a ether filled chamber. In case 
the patient is to be given positive pressure ventilation. An Oxford inflating bellows, which is shown in the picture, could be interposed between the vaporizer and the patient so that it could function as a device for assisting the patient's ventilation during the initial period and to control the patient ventilation if required. In case the patient has got adequate respiratory effort, then even if the Oxford inflating ventilators are there, its valve can be inactivated by use of a magnet. The precision had been achieved in this variable bypass chamber by providing, as it has been mentioned by Dr. Barbaraj, by an ether-filled bellow. The ether-filled bellow expands when the room temperature is higher and contracts when the room temperature is lower to allow an even output from the EMO apparatus. Ether vaporization causes considerable amount of cooling of the liquid, so there is a need for thermal stabilization, which had been achieved by a water chamber, which could be filled with water, room, uh, normal water at sea levels. But in case of cold environments, it could be filled with warm water. And in very cold environments, an antifreeze liquid could be used in this chamber. The original concept had been to use it only as an ether vaporizer. But subsequently, a scale had been developed with, for use with trialing so that it could be used as for these two agents. And subsequently, there had been a modification which had been used for methoxyfluorine also. One of the problems which had been there in using EMO at higher altitude had been the air has got an oxygen uh, partial pressure which is lower than at sea level and there is need for oxygen supplementation. And the Indian Armed Forces Brigadier Ram Rao developed a Ram Rao adapter so that oxygen enrichment can be done at the inlet of EMO apparatus. The EMO apparatus along with the OIB had been used as a complete anesthesia system extensively and particularly in even in later years in developing and underdeveloped countries. The application of scientific principles that are relevant to a vaporizer had been fully exploited by Professor McIntosh and Mr. Epstein. And in analyzing those vaporizers, EMO, performance, and the qualities have remained a gold standard for a long time. Even now, EMO has got relevance is what is being felt by many of the anesthesiologists working, particularly in underdeveloped countries. But unfortunately, the non-availability of ether has resulted in a disadvantage that it is no more in use and it has been relegated to a museum piece. In higher altitude, where there is extreme cold temperature, use of ether had been a cause of concern because the room heating used to be with, an op with a fire de device called Bukharis. And that is why conversion of this vaporizer to a a multi agent vaporizer by developing a trialing scale subsequently. Anytime when we consider the properties of vaporizers, the precision which has been brought in by Epstein and McIntosh is always to be remembered. Thank you.
thank you sir for uh, sh sharing your wisdom and experience and um, um, i really appreciate uh, you joining our uh, webinar as a moderator and uh, during our association with uh, sri gogulam medical college i was amazed to see the anesthesia museum set up by you uh, which will be a great treasure for generations because uh, most of the equipments uh, uh, are actually disappearing now in the modern era uh, even uh, i think uh, to get a magil circuit uh, for a webinar they were struggling so these things are disappearing but um, very important to know these things uh, so that we can understand the basics before going into the present one though we call it as uh, updated one or latest ones but unless we know about uh, these things actually we will understand the basic physical principles better with the working of uh, these equipments actually that uh, anesthesia museum historical one will look like an, an anatomy museum also because sir has managed to get some specimen from anatomy museum also so that the newcomers to anesthesia will understand how uh, even an endotracheal tube is placed and how this um, spine looks like though we are in a digital simulation era these things do carry their uh, um, significance and uh, i think uh, it's really interesting to see how the molecules of uh, anesthetic uh, liquid anesthetic agents are uh, recreated we will get a three dimensional impact i think um, uh, last time when we did a conference we show showcased that museum also so it's uh, worth visiting and um, i appreciate sir your effort and in maintaining this museum uh, with your academic interest thank you very much sir thank you thank you sanish i hope people contribute towards development of this museum by scouring their storehouses and see whether there are old equipment lying unused thank you very much <laughs> okay okay sure um actually um after a talk by dr babraj and uh, sharing of wisdom by uh, dr uh, air vice marshal uh, dr tp madhusudan it is very difficult to for me to move to the next topic i have put a poll question i think um, from audience side um you can contribute because we will also come to know how you think about uh, uh what is being discussed your involvement is very important we need uh, we actually appreciate uh, interactive sessions but because of lack of time we are uh, uh, changing the question answer session interactive session towards the end of this session we'll try to answer uh, uh, all the queries if possible so um, right now there is a poll in front of you which is the latest anesthesia vaporizer in your hospital or institution so i'll wind up the uh, poll in another few seconds so what i understand is um, the latest uh, i think almost 46% you are having tech 7 vaporizer with you and only 9% are having aladdin cassette vaporizer uh, if you want another few more seconds i can wait but please vote so that uh, we'll have we can contribute to the discussion i can plan the um one more thing i would like to remind you that uh, we we are actually running uh, short of time i will switch gears though the basic fundamental principles are explained well so i will take that uh, clue forward and probably move a little faster um faster i move i don't know whether uh, precision will follow my talk because uh, precision is what the order of the modern era is okay so you can see the poll results what is uh, precision vaporizers precision basically means your dial setting and your output should be matching okay so most of the um, uh, all the modern vaporizers are agent specific and they should be flow stabilized you should know the um, uh, manufacturer's instruction where uh, which all flow rates or range of flows that has been calibrated or field tested so that is very important so thank you very much for cooperating in the first poll we you can expect uh, another uh, few more polls audience response polls coming up so this is how our uh, 
tech vaporizers will look like i'm audible right so uh, vaporizing chamber will have a lot of a network of internal channels wicks so our idea is to maximize the saturation of the anesthetic vapor inside the vapor vaporizing chamber so that the output will be more or less uh, or almost the same as we intend by turning the dial or keeping the settings so for uh, postgraduates in anesthesia this is uh, uh, one of the uh, messages like when you are shown a vaporizer you can start describing the vaporizers along the classification that's why we have uh, deliberately kept this uh, buttons there so as we go along the classification you will be giving at least uh, seven or eight points regarding the um, that particular uh, vaporizer unit even though you may not go deep into the working principles so this tech seven we can say it's a flow over vaporizer variable bypass concentration calibrated automatic thermo compensation it is a tech 7 vaporizer that's already printed on the vaporizer definitely you can say it's an agent specific you can identify the agent also from the color code this is for isofluorine these vaporizers are plenum vaporizers nowadays it's very difficult to find uh, draw over vaporizers and it is vaporizer out of circuit the reason we have already discussed so we'll start from tech 5 vaporizer again i am trying to describe the tech 5 vaporizer it's a flow over that has wicks to maintain the maximal saturation so it's a variable bypass kind of uh, regulation of output and concentration calibrated easy yes. automatic thermo compensation it has got a thermostat by by metallic strip at the bottom agent specificity no confusion agent specific and this one is for isofluorine it's a plenum vaporizer definitely you can confidently say it's a vaporizer out of circuit because it's a high resistance plenum vaporizer it cannot be used inside okay let's have a look at uh, how tech 5 vaporizer works because basically we are speaking about tech 5 and tech 7 together only cosmetic appearance and some uh, fine things are different different between um, tech 5 and 7 so you can identify the vaporizer inlet uh, this is the elongated passage or uh, what we call it as ippv assembly three will be the helical wicks you can see the liquid vaporized vap liquid agent and uh, labeled as number four and the liquid ascends through the helix through the wicks and the concentration is maximum at the bottom but actually it can ascend up to the top part of the helix okay five will be the rotatory valve and uh, six will be the bimetallic strip you can see that is in the bottom part but in the bypass chamber we already uh, discussed how this bimetallic strip regulates the um, aperture in the bypass track and uh, now we'll try to trace fresh gas flow enters bit of it enters into the main uh, vaporizing chamber and most of it goes through the bypass chamber through the aperture allowed by the bimetallic strip and it will reach almost to the outlet okay now depending on the dial setting there will be a splitting ratio set and depending on that if a portion will try to get into the vaporizing chamber but on the way, these are the hurdles it has to go through. It goes through the IPPV assembly or the elongated passage. It comes out, yes, it comes out and goes to the uh, helical wicks. They, these are, are not independent ones, these are continuous. You can imagine like a spiral, like it goes from here to here and then it comes through the back and go, exits through here. Not exiting, actually this is a cross section. Eventually it will flow over the liquid agent, ca catch the vapors and then it will move up through these channels. It will go to the mixing chamber and the output comes. You can see the um, isofluorine color coded dots along with the fresh gas flow color coded dots mixed together. So the output is regulated by the dial setting and we make sure that uh, depending on the splitting ratio with whatever proportion of the fresh gas flow goes into the IPPV assembly and helical wicks take maximal saturated vapor and goes to the mixing chamber and into the outlet so the dilution happens 
So this is the mechanism to make sure that uh, it actually saturates maximum. The maximum precision is maintained. This is actual working diagram of this uh, Tech 5 vaporizer. And this is how it goes for our postgraduate uh, friends. I am trying to trace it. So from inlet, it goes here. This is the bypass chamber. You can find it goes through the uh, bypass chamber, the aperture regulated by the thermostat or my metallic strip. And then it ascends and uh, goes to the mixing chamber. Now, after splitting, what happens to the uh, portion of the gas going to the vaporizing chamber? It goes like this. Okay, it comes down. Now, into the elongated assembly or IPPV assembly, you can see the arrow mark. This is actually continuous passage. It exists and then goes to the wicks pa uh, passage, helical wicks. It enters the helical wicks, takes the roller coaster down, and then over the liquid. The this is the vaporizing chamber. The liquid agent will be somewhere here. It will carry the vapor, and from now on, the color changes because now the carrier gas is enriched maximally with the vapor molecules, and then it goes, comes up here, yeah. It goes to the top unit, then it reaches the mixing unit, and then the output is fresh gas flow mixed with the maximally saturated vapor, and the amount of vapor output should be decided by the dial setting. So this is the working. For so initially, I showed a simplified diagram. This is the actual cross section of the Tech 5 vaporizer. So to describe the outside features, you can identify the control dial here. There is a release button. Only after pushing or pulling the release button, it can be activated. There is a locking lever labeled as number three. So if the vaporizer is mounted on the back bar, this locking lever should be locked. And if you, from the uh, front view, you can see the side glass through which we can identify the liquid agent level. Okay, there, there is an internal baffle system to um, increase the precision. There is a thermostat bimetallic strip at the bottom in a separate chamber. And spiral wick, I have already explained, wick skirt dips into the liquid agent and there is an IPPV assembly in Tech 5 vaporizer. A little uh, about the filling devices. I mentioned it as an agent specific vaporizer. So now we, we have to avoid cross filling. So like lock and key principle, they have designed keyed filling devices. So one end and the vaporizer end, it is a, a key like thing. And uh, uh, the bottle also should be tailor made for that particular agent only. So only the, this key is required. That is one drawback with this kind of uh, keyed filling devices, because if key is missing, you have the vaporizer, you have the correct agent bottle, but you cannot fill. So that is the disadvantage. So this one, this end clearly fits only into isofluorine bottle. And the red one will clearly fit, exactly fit into halothane bottle only. There is no exchange of uh, keys. And this end is also tailor-made for that particular agent. So this is called Fraser Sweatman pin safety system. And this one color code says it's for isofluorine. And how do you fill the vaporizer? So you can see there is a, a filling or draining port there. This is the key uh, for isofluorine. There is a locking lever. This is the side glass. Number four is the side glass. And we have a chamber lock also. Okay, so how do we fill it? I am trying to um, describe it in a graphical manner. So the key goes in, okay, and the locking lever is locked. And now you lift the bottle, then open the lever, then only the continuity is maintained. Now the liquid seeps into the vaporizing chamber. And as it fills, you can see the liquid level rising in the uh, side glass provided in the anterior part. Again, once you drop the bottle, you can drain the vaporizing chamber also. Okay, so I'm not going to the details. Um, another model will be Dragger 19.1 vaporizer. Again, it's a flow over kind of vaporizer with wicks. Regulation of output, it's a variable bypass vaporizer. 
temperature compensation is automatic thermal compensation with a metallic rod. We have already seen how that inward rod works. Agent specificity is agent specific. It's a plenum vaporizer and is a vaporizer outside the circuit. Okay, you can see the diagram. I'm not going to uh, describe the uh, diagram in detail, but since it is given in the textbook, the basic principle is the same. So as the vaporization proceeds, the liquid starts cooling, the bypass chamber aperture becomes limited. So more of fresh gas flow or carrier gas is forced to go and take whatever lesser vapor is present in above the liquid. So ultimately the result, end result will be a compensated, thermocompensated precision vaporizer output. Okay. This is the um, next generation dragger vapor 2000 vaporizers. Again, it's a flow over vaporizer. It has got wicks, regulation of output, variable bypass, automatic thermocompensation is there. It's agent specific, plenum and vaporizer out of circuit. So no need to uh, think too much when you see a, a modern vaporizer like this. Again, you have to note that there is a transport or T mode on the concentration dial. So it can be mounted on dragger plug-in system or GE select air tech system. So it suits the most of the modern anesthesia workstations. Okay. Tech 7 vaporizer, you know, uh, we have already described the Tech 5. Tech 5 and Tech 7 differences are less. I've already described it uh, as an example. It's a flow over with Wix variable bypass uh, vaporizer, automatic thermal compensation, bimetallic strip, agent specific, plenum and vaporizer out of circuit. Okay, agent specificity, you can see the color code, yellow is for uh, servofluorine, purple is for isofluorine. Again, uh, wider selection of filler assemblies have come up for uh, Tech 7, a change in the cosmetic appearance over Tech 5 to match the manufacturers workstation actually that is um, tech seven the major difference we'll uh, see is a goodbye to the six step keyed filling process complex filling procedure used in the tech five was evolved to evolved into a faster easier and cost effective process we have uh, newly designed filling devices this is for uh, uh, severfluorine ge healthcare says it's easy fill system for isofluorine, it is a dragger fill system. These are manufacturer's names. And for severfluorine, it's quick fill system. You can identify the agent by the color code. Okay, note that the filler on the bottle is uh, secured by a crimped metal seal also. I assume that my mouse is also uh, viewable for the audience. Okay. Desfluorine is a different agent. It belongs to a totally different category. The filling device is called a safety fill system. So it even applies to our Aladdin vaporizers. So as the contents are pressurized that ambient temperature because this boiling point is around 23 degrees. The glass bottle is encased in a plastic coat because in case uh, it cracks the glass bottle, it, will, it should not explode. So there is a plastic coat also to the uh, desfluorine bottle. The filling device is termed as safety fill system. And for Aladdin cassette vaporizers also, you, you have the similar uh, filling systems, quick fill for a serfluorine, key filling for isofluorine and safety for desfluorine. You can identify by the color code for the volatile agent. And now uh, we have mentioned that uh, Goldman vaporizer we can use in series. How about the uh, new tech vaporizers? It cannot be used in series, though all the residents would have seen at least uh, two vaporizers mount simultaneously on the back bar. But even though it is uh, more than one may be mounted, but we can activate only one at a time. Okay, so one such uh, mechanism is, uh, uh, Select a tech vaporizer system. Okay, here you can see the diagram. This is the release bar. Okay, this is the rear end and this is a cross section. You can see the extension rod. Actually, I have highlighted it with the colors. I think it should be visible as orange rods. It's not orange, just for uh, 
uh, identifying it. So as we activate the release button, the rod extends laterally outwards. Okay. So what happens is if the second vaporizer, we try to con uh, use the release button, there is no space for the extension rod of the second vaporizer to come out. Okay, that's how it blocks. This extension rod actually sees to it that the second vaporizer extension rod has no space to expand sideways. Another difference that you have to note is like the previous vaporizers, the gas, carrier gas is not flowing through the vapor, uh, bypass chamber when the dial setting is nil. When the dial is not open, it is not at all going into the vapor, vaporizer at all. It goes through the manifold bypass. It is not entering the vaporizer. And once the vaporizer is activated, it goes into the vaporizer unit. And then the resultant gas comes out and joins the common gas outlet. So this is how the uh, newer uh, vaporizers differ from the previous ones. This is another uh, graphical representation. We have vaporizer one and two mounted close together. You can note the extension rods. Now both the extension rods are inside the unit. What happens when the carrier gas comes, here it is blocked so that it is not going into the vaporizer. No output also. It it passes, same thing with the vaporizer two also. Now we try to open the vaporizer two. Here you can appreciate that the two extension rods are stretching sideways, extending sideways. And this opening, the uh, this one is open. Now what happens is the gas from the manifold bypass, when it comes to vaporizer two, it can go to the vaporizer two take the vapor molecules, vaporizer output comes and joins back the machine outlet. Okay, so here is how it happens. Vaporizer two is on, the sideways extension rods are pushing out. Now the vaporizer two is in business. So now a mysterious anesthesia uh, resident or technician tries to open the vaporizer one to check the selected tech vaporizer. I think even the consultants can be mischievous sometimes, at least to demonstrate that uh, the second vaporizer cannot be opened. So you try to uh, activate the release button, it's not happening because there is no space for the uh, extension rods to come out. So that is how it makes sure that uh, this only one vaporizer can be opened at a time. If you um, look at the workstation very closely, you can see from here, it goes to the vaporizer. Here, the vaporizer output joins the back bar manifold. Okay. And uh, some of the machines, it's mentioned clearly whether tech four, seven or more can be accommodated because there are some minor uh, um, identification spe uh, specifications mentioned there so that uh, we can put tech seven or more. And some machines you can see more than or equal to or Tech five or above. And again, you can note this. Uh, I hope uh, my mouse can be seen. Here you can see the extension rod. And on the side of the machine, on the side, lateral most part, you can see a hole which will accommodate the extension rod when it is uh, coming out of the unit or pushing sideways. So, otherwise, if this hole is not there, you will not be able to activate the vaporizer mounted here. So that is a safety feature. You can do only one at a time. And uh, over the years, we are familiar with the dragger interlock system. Again, it's a, um, an interesting one. The, here we have uh, three vaporizers mounted, one for halothane, one for enfluorane, and one for isofluorane. First, uh, let's switch on isofluorane, see what happens. The moment I switch on isofluorane, these rods change like this because of the pressure of this rod. The upper rods change and make sure that this slot is getting locked. So if you want to open halothane, now it's not possible because it's locked here. Here also it's locked. Only isofluorine is unlocked. Okay, now you switch off isofluorine. Now you try to switch on n-fluorine. 
again this rod is pushed and the top bars are uh, changing their configuration result is pushing in of this rod into this slot so that these two sideways vaporizers are locked so we cannot activate halothane isofluorine at this point of time again we'll close this try to open halothane now so again similar to isofluorine when halothane is open the configuration changes and these two vaporizers get locked and we cannot operate or work with the, these two vapor, uh, vaporizers. So this is the principle of uh, uh, select attack mechanism. Again, uh, we'll have one more poll question appearing before you. Uh, this is regarding tech six vaporizer. Uh, you need to indicate whether uh, actually you are using tech 6 vaporizer. So your voting time starts now. We'll get another uh, 10 more seconds for voting. Otherwise, we'll run short of time. So I see a um, very encouraging response from the audience. So I understand that a good number of people are actually using tech 6 vaporizer. That's a very good sign. So almost 45% uh, says uh, they are actually using Tech 6 vaporizer. Okay, thanks for your response. So again, how to describe Tech 6 vaporizer? Vaporization method is uh, slightly tricky and uh, one of the established textbook um, coins this word, saturated vapor generator as a classification from vaporization method. It's an injection type of vaporization. We'll come to the uh, working principle later. Temperature compensation, it's an externally supplied heat uh, thermal compensation. It's agent specific only for desflurane. Yes, it's a plenum type of vaporizer, uh, vaporizer and it's a vaporizer out of circuit. So from the look of it, it can be identified that it's a tech 6 vaporizer and this is the only vaporizer as of now which requires additional uh, electric uh, connection. Okay. So uh, this gets uh, switched on automatically when the unit is connected to the electricity supply and almost five to 10 minutes of warm up time is required to reach operating temperature. During this time, the concentration dial cannot be turned down. So those who are familiar with their desflurane will agree with me. And uh, regarding the dial setting, you can see the dial setting up to 18%. Okay, so concentration dial has graduations of 1% up to 10%. And after 10, 2% increments, it's uh, marked. So there is an interim stop at 12%, which can be manually overridden. So we have to activate one more time to go beyond 12%. Why? Because uh, this is also giving an indication that uh, there is also a possibility of uh, reaching your uh, gas mixture to hypoxic uh, range because it's not like a 2%, 3%, it's, you are going to be giving 18% or 16% or 12% like that. So you have to have that in mind. So just for that, we have to activate it one more time. So first, press the release button to activate it. You can go up to 12%, then again, one more activation to go beyond 12%. And for uh, residents and my uh, junior friends, I would like to give this uh, mnemonic kind of thing, how to remember things about values about desflurane. Actually, uh, like uh, most of the advertisement you see in the modern era, uh, you can see one uh, fine print thing. The approximate values are used here just to make learning simple. These are not absolute values. There are many number six, associated with the desflurane. How many number of fluoride atoms? It's six. Saturated vapor pressure at 20 degrees in millimeters of mercury, it's 666. You might find it as a 669 or sometimes 670 or some others say 684, but it's easy to remember as uh, somewhere around triple six. Boiling point, it's uh, 22 point something, but we can make it as 24 so that it will become six into four is 24. The MAC percent, 6%. MAC percent is 6. The oil gas partition coefficient is 18. Again, you can remember as 6 into 3 is 18. And the vaporizer is tech 6 vaporizer. Again, the dial is a maximum of 18. 
that is 6 into 3 is 18 and we require overriding at 12 percent that is 6 into 2. So the number 6 comes uh, very often when you discuss or uh, learn about uh, desflurane, vapor desflurane and its vaporization. Again look into the front panel how many LED indicators you can see. Yeah, five LED lights. Okay, alarm, battery low, warm up, low agent, no output, operational. And again, there is an LCD level indicator. There are 20 vertically mounted uh, bars. And uh, depending on the level, we can assume that when it is in the lowest, you can assume that it's almost 60 ml is remaining. Up to this mark, it is 240 ml. So that uh, this will take uh, 240 more ml. And the maximum is 390 ml. If you look closely, like we have mentioned, many number of number six appears when I speak about uh, desflurane. Here also, I would say the number of uh, indicators are five LEDs plus one uh, uh, liquid level indicator. Again, the number six comes into play once again when we speak about uh, desflurane vaporizer. And it's an interesting question why desflurane needs to be heated. Actually, uh, I had put a uh, YouTube video on uh, why desflurane needs to be heated uh, in my uh, personal YouTube channel called Anesthesia Tools. Actually, there are different explanations. People approach the explanation in different ways. Uh, it's highly volatile liquid and its uh, saturated vapor pressure is 664. And it's uh, very close to our uh, atmospheric pressure of 760 because the other agents in the competition, they are in and around 220s and all. And the boiling point is 22.8. The theater operating room temperature, we assume that it's around 20, 21, and it's very close to its boiling point. So these are the reasons which will require a separate mechanism. The flow over cannot work. Again, this uh, uh, saturated vapor pressure against uh, temperature we have already shown. But again, you can note that as the sudden vaporization happens, a huge amount of liquid agent gets converted into vapor. When that happens, a lot of heat energy is lost from the liquid agent and the temperature tends to drop. So what is the implication? Even if one degree drop in temperature happens with the initial one bus of uh, vaporization, what happens at the desflurane end? You can see the drop in saturation pressure, uh, uh, saturated vapor pressure is much higher, much, much higher, many times higher compared to what happens with halothane or even serbofluorine. So in order to maintain the uh, precision, we cannot rely on a simple flow over mechanism. Second, the moment it vaporizes, it gives a huge amount of output and to dilute it to physiologically useful 6%, 8% or 10%, we might require a huge amount of fresh gas flow. That is also uneconomical. So that's why uh, the mechanism has changed from flow over to an injection type of vaporizer where the liquid desflurane gets heated to around 38 degrees in a separate chamber and the vapor pressure builds up to almost two atmosphere. And now, depending on your dial setting, there is a CPU controlled uh, flow control valve. It releases a given amount of uh, desflurane vapor into the fresh gas outlet. Again, there is another correction factor. Depending on the fresh gas flow of the carrier gas, it is also sensed by the differential pressure transducer and at minor adjustments in the vapor output is uh, maintained so that you will get a precision output at the tech six vaporizer. So this is the reason why you cannot rely on a simple wait and watch policy for handling desflurane. It's highly volatile. So we have to control it in a separate chamber, heat it and then release it in a controlled fashion into fresh gas outlet. Again, how to fill the desflurane vaporizer. Yeah, all my uh, junior colleagues and friends will remember that when you want to refill the surfloor and vaporizer, you have to stop the vaporizer because when the vaporizer is on, you cannot fill the vaporizer. But with regard to desfloor and vaporizer, the manufacturer says you need not uh, switch off the uh, vaporizer 
um, definitely when the um, volume percentage or dial setting is in the range of 6 to 8% and all, you need not switch off the displacer and vaporizer. You can proceed with the refilling it. So you can attach the um, uh, safety fill system bottle into this um, filling system and then turn it upwards, rotate it upwards like this. Okay. And now the liquid seeps into the vaporizing chamber. So this is how you fill. So the difference is, slight difference is, you need not close the vaporizer all the time. And then after you fill, you reduce it or lower it back to the original position, wait for a few seconds, then release it. Because um, there is very unlikely chance that the liquid agent will spill over outside. But even that happens, it will, within seconds, it will get vaporized and uh, get into the atmosphere. And I think I'll uh, keep this space so that uh, I'll be able to finish in time. It's already 8.48, Aladdin cassette vaporizer. This is uh, one of the uh, electronically controlled uh, vaporizer. Again, I would like to hear from you how many of you are uh, um, comfortable or uh, directly using uh, Aladdin vaporizer. You can start voting now. I'll put the um, polling for uh, maybe another 10 seconds. We will move ahead. Okay. Okay, fine. So um, thank you for your response. And uh, I think majority of uh, the audience says it's not available in my institution. I'll also join the majority because it's not available in my institution as well. So it works only with the latest sophisticated anesthesia workstation. Yes, that is one of the limitations. It works with the um, ISIS uh, anesthesia workstation. Uh, yeah, it should be easy to use because it's a uh, CPU controlled uh, precision vaporizer. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, input. This has got two different parts. What electronic vaporizer control unit, which is built in into the anesthesia workstation. And also what the figure I have shown before, it's a coded agent cassettes, which are colored and magnetically coded. Colored for us to understand, magnetically coded for the machine to understand. We have Aladdin uh, cassettes and vaporizer for uh, cassettes for halothane, isoflurane, influorane, serfluorane, and desflurane. Okay, um, only recently I came to know that already we are into the second generation. Okay, as uh, most of you mentioned, it can be used only with the modern versions of the anesthesia workstations like Datex Omega S5 ADU or GE ISIS anesthesia workstation. This is uh, generation one, and this is the second generation Aladdin vaporizer. First generation has key fill system. Now easy fill system has come. So second generation has a bigger liquid display. There is a locking lever. You can see it is not there with the first generation. There is an additional liquid level sensor and there is this symbol in the second generation. Advanced uh, internal temperature sensing mechanism is there with the second generation Aladdin vaporizers. Just to identify the parts, one is the agent chamber. Second one is the eject handle. Now the third one is for filling, key filling system, because this is generation one. And four will be the, uh, the options will be key fill, quick fill, and safety fill. Uh, number four is liquid level indicator. And this is not the dial. Uh, young friends, the, please don't misunderstand. This is the filler wheel that first locks the key filler and then opens the gas and liquid channels. Overfill protection system is built in with this uh, Aladdin cassette. Okay, this is how you mount the Aladdin cassette into the uh, anesthesia workstation. And again, it's uh, very interesting to note that uh, minimum fresh gas flow for agent delivery is mentioned. 200 ml per minute will allow agent delivery. If it comes uh, to 150 ml per minute or low, below, it will shut off the agent delivery. So that is uh, one thing you have to understand, especially when you go to very low flows like metabolic flows. It's virtually maintenance free, free as well as per the manufacturer. Filling options, key fill, quick fill, and safety fill. 
Okay, so this is the diagram. And I think uh, if you are preparing for exam, don't get scared uh, by seeing this diagram. I'll try to make it simplified. That is my objective of choosing this. Okay, imagine we'll forget about all the decorations. Imagine this diagram. This actually uh, is very close to what um, Dr. Barbara just mentioned for a prototype uh, flow over vaporizer. Let's see what happens. You can see the fresh gas flow going through the bypass chamber. Depending on your dial setting, a part of it goes into the vaporizing chamber inlet. Now the vaporizing chamber, you can see the liquid agent and the liquid, uh, the vapor molecules in equilibrium with it, maybe at the saturated vapor pressure. So this carrier gas carries the uh, vapor molecules and through the chamber outlet, vaporizing chamber outlet, it joins the common gas outlet, bypass chamber to the common gas outlet. Doesn't it look simple? It's almost like the uh, initial prototype flow over vaporizer. And now we'll uh, bring back all the decorations. Actually, all the add-on things are to maintain the precision or to increase the safety or to regulate a precision flow, nothing much. Once you understand the value, uh, role of each and every component, things are very simple because the fundamental basic working principle is going to be the same again. Again, we'll uh, take a second lap. We'll delete all the uh, uh, markings or labels. Here you can see the fresh gas flow going through the common gas outlet. Part of it goes into the vaporizing chamber. You can see, see one inflow valve. These are mechanical valves and then it carries the vapor molecules, outflow valve, again mechanical, it goes through the uh, vaporizer outlet. There is a flow sensor, which will play an important role, I'll tell later. Then it joins the bypass uh, part of carrier gas and goes into the common gas outlet with a precision amount of the volatile anesthetic agent. So this is the working principle. So two parts, one is CPO part, which is integrated with the anesthesia workstation. We are now concentrating on what happens at the cassette. So these are the cassettes for our uh, eyes. It is color coded. Okay. There is a liquid level, liquid sense uh, level, which is electronically working and cassette ID, which is magnetically coded. You can see cassette temperature sensor here on sophistication uh, is getting started because the temperature should not vary the output. So that's the idea of having a cassette temperature sensor. Okay, now you have a check valve at uh, both ends at the inflow and outflow. Only when the cassette is mounted on the machine, this will be uh, open. Then it goes through the outflow close valve. And then there is a liquid spill prevention valve. Okay, this is very important. There is a cassette pressure sensor. Here I have mentioned about the temperature sensor. Now on additional ground, there is a pressure sensor, which is sensing the pressure inside the cassette. So what it will do is, if the cassette pressure goes beyond an acceptable rate, no more fresh gas flow will be sent into the vaporizing chamber. That is one thing. So depending on the dial setting, if vapor is already carried, it might uh, release into the uh, common gas outlet depending on the proportional flow rate. And if too much of gas is accumulating or pressure sensor is in the dangerous level, there is a cassette pressure relief valve which will release the excess vapor vent out into the scavenging system so that uh, cassette pressure comes back to acceptable limit. And once it happens, again, the door opens and the uh, fresh gas flow or carrier gas starts to flow into the vaporizing chamber. So that is a safety feature. There is a liquid spill prevention valve also. This is the proportional flow valve, which will in some scenarios will act like uh, a measured flow vapor output. So depending on the input from the CPU, it will deliver the uh, calculated amount of vapor into the common gas outlet. Okay. So there is an outflow flow meter and inflow flow meter to give instructions or messages into the CPU. 
And uh, this is uh, very important. There is a manifold temperature sensor and this sign says there is advanced temperature sensing mechanism with that uh, generation or kind of Aladdin cassette vaporization. This back pressure regulator also comes into play in certain scenarios so that um, outflow uh, precision out, output of the vapor is maintained. Okay, so this is that was the graphical diagram. This is the actual cassette uh, dissected. You can find uh, this is the uh, you can find one one by one. These are the wicks. The two these are the lamellae. I know I am going slightly faster because we need to finish in time. This is the inlet valve. So the carrier gas comes here. It gets fully saturated with the agent and then goes through the outlet. And this has been augmented by, uh, okay, I'll come to that later. Here you can see the contact for electronic temperature sensor and liquid agent level. Again, there is a temperature sensor strip you can identify here. Okay, this is the handle to mount the vaporizer cassette. Again, this is the fill system. Liquid level window is here. These are the agent identification magnet, which may not be visible outside. So this is how the cross section of the Aladdin vaporizer looks like with all the precision control mechanisms. The carrier gas gets fully saturated and the release out to, through the outlet is also controlled by the uh, CPU. So here you can fill the liquid agent. It comes here and then goes into the uh, vaporizing chamber. You can see the baffles. Uh, recently, we had a wonderful article in uh, our Indian Journal of Anesthesia on the modern vaporizers by uh, Dr. Pangas Kundra Gosami and uh, Dr. Aruna Parameshwari. This has been a uh, wonderful piece of literature or uh, in the research article, well-researched article with uh, good uh, graphical de depictions. It's worth reading. I'll definitely recommend all my um, uh, PG friends, uh, younger colleagues to read that. Okay, we'll uh, finish with uh, Aladdin vaporizers for the time being. Then we'll uh, slightly touch upon the injection vaporizers. Again, uh, I'm curious to know how many of uh, our audience are actually uh, using injection kind of vaporizers. The poll is on. We'll wind up in uh, another 10 seconds. You can uh, post your response. Yes, uh, like me, it's new to me by many of you. I'm not influencing your response. I just want to see um, how our audience perceive regarding this, okay. Macquot or Dragger injection vaporizers. Yes, I'm happy to see that um, uh, at least uh, 10, 14 percent people are currently using it. Of course, a good number of people have read about it, heard about it, and uh, of course, uh, for some people, it's uh, new. Okay, so again, I'll uh, request you to go through the article I mentioned here. And now the question is, why do you need injection vaporizers? We have all the set of vaporizers, tech vaporizers, and even you go to Aladdin vaporizers. Why do you need more? We'll take a simple calculation. So you want to achieve a 2% end tidal anesthetic concentration of serfluorine. How do you do that? So we'll go into the physical or basic mathematics. That means end tidal uh, anesthetic concentration of 2% means volume in ml of serfluorine divided by total capacity of the reservoir, which includes the FRC and the circuit volume into 100 should be two. So the volume of serfluorine divided by, we'll take it as 6,000 ml or six liters into 100 is 2%. So solving it, so we need to add 120 ml of serfluorine vapor into a fresh gas flow of six liters in one minute to achieve an end tidal concentration of 2%. I think it's clear. So our aim is to achieve 2% end tidal concentration, anesthetic concentration of serfluorine. Our uh, total capacity, reservoir capacity is uh, six liters, including the FRC and the um, circulation volume, uh, respiratory volume. So six liters, we have to add 120 mLs to create a 2% serfluorine. So if you are using 6%, we have uh, enough and more uh, gadgets available. 
But suppose you want to achieve it with a fresh gas flow of 180 ml per minute. That is near metabolic fresh gas flow, which is uh, 3.5 ml per kg in a 50 kg patient. So you are going to add only 180 ml in one minute. So can you achieve 2% serve flow rate in tidal concentration? Now you go back to the calculation again. So what percentage of serve flow rain we can generate this amount of uh, vapor, volume of serve flow rain vapor to create 2% internal concentration with 180 ml fresh gas flow. So again, the volume of serve flow rain, we know it's going to be uh, 120 ml. We take this and add the one, 180 ml. Okay, we are going to add uh, 120 ml into this 180 ml fresh gas flow and solving it uh, 120 divided by 300 into 100 and it comes to 40 percent subflurane and the question is how do you build or create a 40 percent mixture of uh, or output of subflurane no that is impossible that is the answer with the given set of uh, vaporizers but uh, human kind is such that whenever say if you say impossible, somebody else may be saying, I am possible. So the maximum dial concentration for uh, sulfur and vaporizer is 8%, but uh, they have devised a new device that is the injection vaporizer to generate 40% outlet uh, output. So this is the cross-section diagram. So this is an injection type of vaporizer. This is the cross-section. I know uh, uh, for those... Uh, of you who are seeing this diagram for the first time, it will take some time for you to understand the parts and how it works, I agree. So you can refer to the article in Indian Journal of Anesthesia I mentioned just now. So there is a driving gas. This is an added component coming into the vapor, uh, liquid vapor chamber or vaporizer liquid container and it builds up pressure. So with the driving pressure, this liquid is being pushed into a vaporizer injector. Okay, so with this push, the injector works. And the injector actually sprays a calculated amount of uh, uh, liquid agent into the vaporizing chamber. Okay, so this is the liquid container, this is the vaporizing chamber. And there is a particular temperature maintained inside the vaporizing chamber so that the uh, liquid particles will be converted into vapor form. Okay, driving gas comes, it pushes the uh, liquid in the liquid container and into the injector. If you see the uh, fresh gas inlet, the carrier gas comes and leaves. And now what happens is depending on our dial setting or setting of entered target anesthetic concentration, the number of uh, liquid sprays are done since this chamber is heated, it becomes a vapor and then joins the carrier gas and the output is obtained. So this is a kind of injection vaporizer. The liquid agent is converted into a vapor form and added to the carrier gas to give a given or a targeted output percentage. This is how it works in simple terms. And the temperature in, in the vaporizing chamber is maintained in a particular temperature for each given agent. Another mechanism is uh, DIVA. This is not the DIVA we used to hear in anesthesia. Nowadays, we are going to hear about direct injection of a vapor anesthetic vaporizer. Again, the MACWIT vaporizer. Again, the idea is the same. We are going to inject a calculated amount of liquid agent, convert into vapor, and then add to the fresh gas flow. And this is also something new which has come into the practice in, I think many countries, they have started using it. The anesthetic conservating device, Anaconda. Okay, the simplicity is, this is a small device, just like our HMA filter, which can be connected between the endotracheal tube and the white piece of the circuit. Okay, and you can have the gas monitoring port available and the volatile agent syringe pump is connected to the machine end and a given amount of uh, vapor is carried through the ventilator circuit into the patient. So without having an anesthesia machine inside the ICU, 
we can have the volatile agents delivered for various purposes for bronchodilatation or for uh, added sedation. We can use this agent. Uh, so this is the diagram. We have uh, two kinds of anaconda where prices on 100 ml capacity and 50 ml capacity. This is how it is connected between the endotracheal tube and the Y piece of the breathing circuit. Here you can see the uh, syringe infusion device connecting it and there is a gas sampling option also so that we can see the output concentration. If you look closely, so this is the patient end, this is the machine end or ventilator end. Here is the tubing from the injector syringe. Okay, if you see there is a filter kind of thing, one end is HMA filter, the viral bacteria filter or humidity, uh, heat and humidity exchanger like uh, we used to have. And there is a broad active carbon layer or reflector. Here you can find an evaporator rod or vaporizer. So the liquid agent gets vaporized as the carrier gas oxygen air mixture comes uh, here. It will carry the vapor molecules also and it will be taken to the patient through the endotracheal tube into the lungs. So while exhalation, what will happen is this gas mixture along with the exhaled amount of vapor molecules will come back and this will be, the vapor molecules will be absorbed by the active carbon layer, which is upstream of the HME layer. Okay, the, our usual HME layer. So what happens is next time when the carrier gas comes, this will take the uh, vapor molecules carried in the carbon layer and takes it to the patient. So we can minimize the wastage of uh, um, anesthetic agent. That is why it is called as uh, anesthetic conserving device. Here you can see the isofluorine getting delivered. This evaporated rod delivers the isofluorine vapor and it is carried through the carrier gas or the FiO2, whatever FiO2 you have set, air oxygen mixture will carry it to the patient. And during exhalation, these additional or exhaled isofluorine molecules will be absorbed by the reflector or the carbon layer, and it will be carried through the next cycle. Okay, the, this is in nutshell regarding the modern ventilators. I know I have exceeded the time. I have tried to uh, be uh, brief, but uh, I agree that I have been uh, slightly quick also because we are already uh, running short of time. Uh, thank you very much for patient listening. I hope at least uh, I was uh, successfully introduced you to the concept of uh, newer vaporizers because in the subsequent years, you may be using it in a routine manner because the way uh, our technology comes to aid us, basically it's to aid in safety because the other day I heard uh, my professor, Dr. Madhusunubad, they are talking on uh, safety in anesthesia practice. All these gadgets, these sophistications are just to maintain safety, not to make you hands-free and uh, check your social media updates during the case. Actually, we are supposed to be more vigilant because we have to monitor the patient, we have to see the monitors and see all the gadgets, infusion pumps round the clock. We should be always busy because these gadgets are actually adding quality but uh, unless you back it up, it will not serve its purpose. Thank you very much. It's uh, over to BRK sir for your remarks.